the sediment. Burrowing by worms allows oxygen into the sediment and now the color is lighter. Once beyond the reach of salt water, algae and grasswort grow and form the fringe of the salt marsh community. They're followed by sea grasses, and the whole area is cut by flow channels. The tidal channels consist of soft mud brought in by the ebb and flow of the tide. And peculiar structures are often associated with that soft mud along the margins of channels. Here, soft sediment has remained liquid beneath a crust on the surface and erupted as a volcano, a sand volcano, the liquid material having burst up to the surface. In the more stable areas of the salt marsh, pools of brackish water often have cracks at the bottom, not due to drying out, but due to chemical changes in the, the mud. Where drying has occurred, very typical polygonal cracks are, are common and are, of course, quite diagnostic of the fact that the mud has dried out. These too can be read in the sediment and in the rock if a rock should result from this mud. Sedimentary rocks are very easily quarried because of their stratification, that is the layering that we've just seen. They have, of course, many economic uses, often as ornamental or as facing stones. The quarrying methods of changed somewhat in the last few tens of years. But it's the old quarrymen who knew most about the geology of the sedimentary rocks and used the lamination in order to split the massive boulders with which they worked. Here the quarryman is using a bedding plane in order to split the sandstone. Between and within the layers of rock, structures are often exposed, which enable us to interpret the origin of the rock when compared with the soft sediment precursors of those rocks. Summarizing then, animal, and they also tell their story when they're preserved in rock. Feeding trails of the low energy environment are also frequently preserved. A section through today's mud flats shows burrows which can also be paralleled in the rock record. The laminations and the burrows of a tidal flat can be paralleled in rock that's 300 million years old. Transient rainstorms and droughts can also be recorded in the rock record. And they reflect moments when the rock was accumulating, the conditions of accumulation of the rock. Here a dead bird and its fossil equivalent. So the size of the fragments in a detrital sedimentary rock 
enable us to interpret the environment in which the sedimentary rock accumulated. For example, a shale formed of very fine grains may well have accumulated in a sheltered lagoon where fine material was able to settle out. A quartzite sandstone may well have accumulated as a beach where the grains were rolled around and the feldspars with the cleavage was eliminated. However, upstream, before the sand had been as washed around as in the river and on the beach, arcos, the sandstone containing feldspar fragments, might well have accumulated. And in that case, we're interpreting the environment by looking at the mineral content of the sandstone, observing the fact that feldspar is there and interpreting the reason for the feldspar being present. The determination of the environment then depends upon size and mineral content. Now, the environment, of course, changes. It doesn't stay static. Where there was once a pond may well be something quite different two or three hundred years later. Where there was a lagoon might well later be a beach. And that leads to the buildup of a sedimentary record with three dimensions, a succession of different kinds of rock. The sediment carried by rivers usually ends up at the coast, where some of it is piled up in the high energy zone of the beaches, but most of it is carried offshore into the relatively calm waters. And it's a good question to ask, what happens to that sediment? The draining of a reservoir into which a stream fed sand and mud for about 30 years provides us with a natural laboratory for answering that question. The sand and the mud in the drained reservoir settled out into horizontal layers. But why did it settle out into horizontal layers? This simplified model of a stream flowing into a reservoir can help us answer that question. As in nature, the stream brings down a mixture of sediments. And when the stream enters the still water, the current slows and those sediments settle out, just as they would have done in the reservoir or at the coast at the mouth of a river. As the stream shifts its course, the sediments are delivered to a new place. And later, the stream changes course again, and so on. The stream delivers a mixture of sediments at different places at different times. And they accumulate on top of one another. And what's the result of this constant change? The result is horizontal layers, as in the reservoir, and as we can assume at the coast. Snow, too, is often deposited in layers because of periodic changes in the direction of the wind. And the layering in this mound of sand and gravel was produced by changes in the proportion of sand and gravel fed onto the elevator. Now, in a real geological example, changes in the sediment type are also responsible for the building up of layers of different composition. For example, in this diagram of a cliff section with shale and sandstone and coal and shale and limestone and so on. Those changes were also caused by changes in the environment and changes in the kind of sediment being supplied to the, to the area. But something else was important in the incorporation of that sediment in the rock record. And that something else is subsidence. On the deep sea floor, it's very easy to build up a succession of layers of, for example, turbidity current deposited graded beds. But a beach, an environment on the coastline, is a very different kettle of fish. Unless the beach subsides or sinks beneath the advancing sea, the sand of that beach will be eroded away just as fast as it's deposited. And the beach will never be preserved in the rock record. It might be the same for the sands and gravels of a, of a riverbed, unless that area sinks and something else is deposited on top, 